This is Podkit, episode 42, React So Strongly, on mid-September 2018. And now, hi time travelers. This episode of Podkit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersat. This episode has show notes at the nexus.tv slash pk42 and is presented from the past. In the future. Just to start off, plug on some hot new Apple news from several days ago. Um, the new uh, September event. You know, take a listen to the Nexus special, which is at the nexus.tv slash ns60. To take a listen to our thoughts of all the juicy new Apple news and thoughts and softwares and phones and watches and etc. Yeah, that was a yeah. good one. Or the, or those that don't happen. Who knows? Yeah. What happened who, who anyway? Who will have known? Yeah, uh, wibbly wobbly, timey wimey stuff. Yeah, you you just never know what products will get released at these Apple keynotes, and well, you know, we'll we'll talk all about how much we got and how much we didn't get. This is true. Yeah. But this episode is all about not Apple stuff, so let's talk about some other news and things. Let us indeed. I see a Scott Hanselman blog post in here. You sure do. So, you know, I, do, you, do you guys know who Scott Hanselman is? I do not, I, I, no. I've got to know him kind of like an old friend on account of me trying to figure out what C-sharp is over the past couple months. Yeah, so he's he's kind of a C-sharp guy. Um, and you know, I I haven't really followed him and his his life and career too too closely, but he um he's a pretty cool um you know person in the uh, community. Um, certainly not one of the JavaScript people that we totally don't follow, but but somebody for sure that's notable. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he, he he published this blog post um probably some time ago, um like two weeks ago, um four weeks ago I don't know uh, a month ago. Yeah, um, and and so you know um, when you read the website though, you know this blog looks like it was um, from like ten years ago on WordPress, but it's totally running on a .NET server, so that's kind of funny. Yeah. Um, but but I really thought this was an interesting post, so so um, you should go read it. But the the idea is, how do you even know this crap? So what what that means is, um, we're all kind of developers here, and some way or another, we develop something. And and some of the people listening to this this episode might also be a developer, uh, and they also might just not be a developer, but also know some strange things that other people don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I often experience this, and I, and and I don't know if it's a syndrome like imposter syndrome, but it's the how do you even know this um, kind of experience. And so um, for context, about a month ago, I was at a Hacker X event. Um, and HackerX is this kind of speed recruiting event where you, you get five minutes to talk to each kind of group and then you rotate. Um, and at some point, um, we got a guy who was uh, an expert in AS400 systems, which is really cool wow. because that's, uh, you know, a kind of a legacy thing now. And there's probably, right. you know, a handful of AS400 experts out there in the world, which is mm-hmm. amazing. Um and and so he was he was um, introducing what he does to 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 the person I was with and 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 me, and he he mentioned AS four hundred and I'm like yeah oh yeah of course, and he's like wow you actually know what that is most people never know what that is, um, and 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 then I thought how do I even know that yeah um and and so that's why this this particular thing resonates with me so well, um, and and so um. This this Hanselman post, you know, he he goes on to to write about this experience about finding an icon, um, and while he isn't really a front end person, he knew there must be a Unicode icon for what he wanted to do, and then one of his fellow engineers said, "How do you even know that?" Um, yeah. And so his perspective on this is that there's this kind of intuition that, you know, developers earlier in their career might not have yet, but this feeling of you know there really must be a function or a site or a tool that does x y or z and that somebody must have already come and done this in this kind of similar situation and right. I, and i think that that's half of it but i think it's also this this other thing about just just retaining knowledge and having exposure so what do you guys think no absolutely i think you know um 
maybe earlier on in in podkit's existence i talked a lot more about um kind of my days when i was doing tier one technical support and i think that's all that's a very similar sort of sort, sort of situation about like retaining knowledge um of uh, like of sources that you don't you don't really remember where you've where you found it out but you're like no i'm pretty sure this is this is how this works and some share of time that that's borne out and other shares of time it's not um i think like as i've moved away from technical support and towards straight up and software engineering um i think that's kind of a, a um a different sort of situation in some ways, but not necessarily in others. I mean, as I, as I kind of mentioned, I've been digging into um, the .NET ecosystem a little bit more the past six months to a year, three three months, six months, year, something like that. And I think something kind of intriguing about um, the .NET ecosystem is that like, um, I have a solid depth of experience in Java. I have a solid de- depth of experience in JavaScript. Um, and I have a solid depth of experience in Ruby and Ruby on Rails in particular. Uh, most of my web development experience has probably been Ruby on Rails APIs, or Node.js APIs, and a JavaScript front end uh, of some of some sort or another. And one of the things that's been super interesting to me as I've been digging more into C Sharp is just how many things I, I'm like, oh well, you know, like, like the the biggest example for me over the past couple months is like I want to know how to do array dot reduce or list dot reduce in C Sharp. And I was like, there has to be something like this. There has to be something like this because it, this can't just be a, something that the, you know, like it sprung for, fully formed out of uh, Brendan Ike's head because I know it wasn't his idea. Right, right? exactly. Um, so uh, I, I looked it up and I looked it up some more and everyone's like, well, yeah, I mean, you can kind of do that, but why would you do that when you have Link? Right. And I was like, well, what, what, <laughs> what the heck is Link? Uh, so I looked that up. And um, link or language integrated queries um, is a is a feature I think mostly of the .NET platform, but it, it's there have been ports to other things too that allow you to do like SQL like things almost um, in code. Um, so you can query uh, a list more or less um, using things like where statements and select statements and stuff like that. And like I know enough SQL to get by, but I don't. I don't really think in those terms in particular. I'd much prefer map, filter, and reduce. Yeah. Um, however, they have something that's similar to um, map that's called select, and they have something similar to reduce, which is called uh, aggregate. And aggregate is really wacky looking. Like all the argument orders are like uh, flipped around, and there's like a um, there's like a second function you can use that's like a you the f- the, the argument order is like your seed your default value and then your what i would call like a reducer function and then the last one is a mapper function basically so you can like reduce to get everything that you want into some reduced object and then map that object to map that array ostensibly or that object into something else um and that's really fascinating it's mm. really cool that they have something like that mm-hmm. um but um that was like one of those things that kind of fits in that in that paradigm i think because like i knew that something like this had to exist i knew that i could write something that did this but it took me a little while to figure out um what it was even though it did eventually end up being borne out right and i think it's a cool parallel of knowledge so like you knew from your own personal experience about mapping and reducing in javascript and you just you you have this sense that well if it can if javascript can do it surely this uh enterprise quality compiled language must also right 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 it might not it might not take the same format it might not look the same right they, th- these folks must have thought of it before javascript did hopefully right? <laughs> almost certainly yeah yeah i think javascript's a unique language where it's you know constantly evolving but i think a lot of features in javascript come from other languages these days especially i mean look at like the pipeline operator proposal and oh yeah um i mean yeah some of these modern es 2015 plus operators um and i think something like npm as well as a package manager can is i think it's a pretty unique package manager and partly because it was later to the game than a lot of other package managers so they could kind of take the best features of the other ones and incorporate them into what is npm totally and i think like i I, I think you're right too, but like, um, what this kind of gets, the what 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 Hanselman's 
post kind of gets to is like this idea of like how do we know what we know um which is which is of course a big thing for me and like what what are, what are these like felt senses that we have and where do they come from mm-hmm. um and i think like like brian said a lot of it's because like the the lineage of these ideas i, I think as you get more familiar with what is out there particularly in the software engineering world but i think also in other disciplines as well you're like this this isn't new this is something that somebody else has thought of before and while it might have a fancy new name like suspense or uh <laughs> it, might, it might have a fancy new name like uh like a uh, um like a uh, like state management right yep um right like state management in a web app isn't really a thing people talked about as a framework level feature until react i would say um or react gave that discussion a new definition right you don't really talk about like state management in in ember there's ember data that's what you use right right um so i i think like as i i think certainly as i've matured and this is it gets to that kind of jadedness we discussed in the fringe is like i've i've um uh, lost patience for folks thinking um or for folks reintroducing new ideas as though they sprung fully formed out of their head without kind of paying respect to the things that came before it yeah i can Um, i can i can see that too i i will say that i think i think there's a difference of wholesale reintroduction like oh yeah i totally just remade i totally just invented promises in javascript like yep that was me totally did that or you know like um you know before promises existed here's uh, in javascript here's here's uh here's here are callbacks and now uh we're introducing promises other languages have always had promises but for javascript developers it was a totally different way of thinking for example oh totally absolutely and so i think it's i think it's uh an interesting thing to think about it might not be a totally uh new idea but if it's new to the people that it's introduced to um and sufficiently different then i think that's okay also no absolutely absolutely yeah i I find this whole topic of how do you even know this um very fascinating because um one of one of my favorite things to do is is to mentor and coach and you know just just expose um others not even just younger developers and 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 those earlier in their career but even those later in their career that just haven't had the opportunities to learn some of these odd things that if you just never had a need to know you just wouldn't know and i think that's just so fascinating yeah i totally agree absolutely so so when, so when the listeners in the future run into this situation of you're you you're helping somebody with something and and you have a suggestion to make because how do you even know this? Um, you know, just just uh, you know, think about that, and uh, you know, maybe maybe give send us a tweet about yeah, that experience because I I want to hear more about what other people feel when they do this kind of thing um, because I think there's also a relationship with this syndrome or mm-hmm. whatever it is to imposter syndrome with which is you know I totally don't know enough and and compared to the other people who know way more I just I know nothing um, right. because I also totally feel that way all the time. Um, right. But then I also Absolutely. feel like this. How do I even know this? Um, so yeah, cool. Right, and that's another part of why I react so strongly to ha- react, uh, react so strongly to <laughs> to kind of some of the stuff that's going on in the JavaScript community is because I, f- I feel that same way. I feel like there are a lot of people who like to act as experts while they're just as um, uh, they're they're figuring this stuff out just as much as anybody else. Yeah. Um, Yep, that's all I'll say about that. Cool. Well, that was that was enough. I think we I think we did a good job. Truly. Um, so now it's time to talk about something controversial. <laughs> um, semicolons or not? Let's just open. Uh, start off and say, do you prefer to use them or not? In like today, not historical, historically, um, but today. I'm. It, I've. I I do use semicolons. In JavaScript or TypeScript, yes. Um, it depends for me. Yeah, I almost always defer to whatever the existing project configuration is. What if but you made a new one? If I made a new one, I would uh, I would probably use my kind of personal um, 
the project configuration bootstrapping, if you can call it that. It's really just a package JSON file that I copy into new projects, run yarn, install yarn, start, and I'm ready to roll. Um, but uh, I, I would probably not use semicolons. Um, which, you know, right, is like, um, if, if I let Prettier do it for me, that's fine. Um, but uh, I think, uh, and, I, and I recognize that there are some situations that this can cause weird um, weird bugs if you're not careful. Um, but simultaneously, you know what? Um, so can most of JavaScript. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not super concerned about um, one more incremental potentially subtle problem in a situation that I think I've just generally learned to avoid over the years. Yeah, so you mentioned Prettier, and I think I think Prettier has kind of caused the semicolon debate to... Um, like reemerge? To, to appear kind of yeah. alongside with the, um, you know, timeless tabs versus spaces debate. Um, and, and also, I guess, JavaScript is kind of unique in the sense that it allows semicolons to be optional, or at least to be optional for you to type even though it imp- in- inserts them wherever it needs to. Right. Yeah. So, so Brian, I want to hear more about your, um, your experience with semicolons because you, you come from a, a, a different background than some of us. Yeah. So I learned programming with Java that uses semicolons. Um, that you know, I've just always used them in JavaScript and now TypeScript. Um, I installed prettier on a new application in the, beginning of august and use the with semi flag um i think that's that's a pattern that pretty much everyone at my work uses is using semicolons i'll occasionally forget to type it if i'm just console logging somewhere to debug something but other than that it's always there that's the norm it looks better to me my ide doesn't warn me i can reconfigure that yes but by default um and i I don't remember who it was. It was a year ago or something. Someone posted an article about saying, you know, the similar thing to what Brandon was saying. There are some weird bugs and quirks that can happen. Um, This person was saying you should probably use semicolons. But then there are things like standard, which doesn't, and prettier, which doesn't by default. Um, So I use the semi-standard style in um, some light, light applications at work. Um, And then prettier now, but with semis. Yeah. Nice. So I um, have a slightly new opinion on this, um, as opposed to my old opinion on this. Yeah. Um, uh, so previously, I was attempting to enforce the no semi lifestyle on all of those that I knew and worked with. Right. Um, which was which did have moderate success, um, but um, that was an easier thing to to. Um, do at the time because we were working on a plain java script back end and front end so it, there wasn't any c sharp there wasn't any java it was just javascript on the client side and on the back back end um so that made it easier to do that now the current project i'm working on with the current team we have an extremely mixed code base. So we have some Kotlin, we have some Rust, we have some TypeScript, we have some JavaScript. And you might argue, well, you're crazy, why do you have all this awful code running around? But that's not the point today. Right. The point is, we do. Um, so Kotlin, um, it uses semicolons. Um, Rust uses all of the semicolons most of the time, although sometimes it's optional, but for actual semantic reasons. TypeScript doesn't necessarily care about semicolons Mm -hmm. but the nestjs framework that we're using ships with a default prettier rc file with the semicolons turned on and then of course the javascript code i write doesn't need semicolons but if i use javascript in those same typescript projects well i might as well just use the same prettier rc file and i Mm -hmm. guess i have to so then i do and it has semicolons so now i guess what i believe is if you're writing plain JavaScript and it's the same on both sides of the divide, you can use no semis and that's fine. But if you do have another language you're using with semicolons as part of the language itself, then you should probably just deal with it and just use semicolons. And that might be why we do that at my work too, because a lot of the app, the code written is in C sharp, which yeah. needs semicolons. So we do. 
I think that's I think that's just a fair reason. Yeah, I I I buy that. I think um you know, um I I'm seeing I'm working on more projects now where the the person who sets them up um or who has set them up because I'm kind of moving uh kind of between projects a little bit more frequently now. Um already has semicolons enforced and I don't mind that one bit because prettier handles fixing that for me. Exactly. Um but uh you know same same sort of thing if i had no semis turned on that person would probably be fine with it too because um no semi like if i have the no semi flag passed to prettier they don't have to care they can put semicolons wherever they want and it'll just be fixed i worked with a developer for a little while who um wasn't familiar with and didn't like the arrow function syntax yep. so we just wrote all of his functions as functions and, and it converted prettier did the rest that's yep. nice yeah, I um my type script um doesn't always get semicolons at the end, especially when I do a console log statement, I just forget to put a semicolon at the end. And so right. Prettier will just come back and just fix it for me, which is wonderful. Yep. That's what it's all about. So I I will also mention that just just the idea of Prettier. Um so do you do you guys think of Prettier as sort of JavaScript's formatter tool? Like that is the that is it. It is oh. a tool for JavaScript style. It's, there's standard, there's custom ESLint configurations. I um, yeah. think those of TSLint. I think of those as different things. I I do too, and I think the reason for it is that I, like kind of the way that Prettier functions is a little different, right? Because it's parsing, it's actually um, getting an abstract syntax tree for your for your JavaScript, right? And it's and it's basically pretty printing that AST back into back into javascript code that's formatted in a certain way whereas like eslint isn't doing that same thing is it not that i know of i'm it, not it can, sure it, uh, eslint can do like um you can you can run fix with eslint and that will uh fix things <laughs> um right 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 but it's not it's not actually yeah like, it's different converting it to an AS, ast and then back into it might do that in order to actually make those fixes, but it's certainly not reformatting most of the time. Right. Um, well, so the, so the reason I bring this up is so so Go has something called Go FMT, and um, basically, if you want to put your code onto the Go repository, you run Go FMT, Go Format, before you do it, um, and then all Go code is basically formatted in this singular singular uniform way. Um, there's a Rust if Rust FMT Rust formatter, which you can use to format all of your Rust code, and I'm pretty sure it's turned on by default whenever you use VS Code with um, the um, RLS tool, which is the Rust language server. Um, so so I I kind of I kind of think now that most future languages will have this kind of default formatter, um, and the reason I think that's really good is that it makes reading code from anywhere kind of have this uniform you know syntax a uh, bixby just turned on that's pretty funny <laughs> i don't i don't know how saying rust fmt triggers bixby but that's cool um yeah. we'll talk about that in a little bit um so i i just think it's interesting that the new languages have this and so the reason i also think that's important to bring up is because i was coding in java and kotlin recently mm -hmm. and it was infuriating that they don't have a language level formatter so right. you can you can tell eclipse or uh, intellij or whatever weird thing you use to code java to actually format right. but it's not the language settings it's your settings and sure you can change prettier rules a little bit here and there but it's generally something that is applied separately from the ide and i think that's a big deal right um the first time i'd ever heard of some like a like a language doing something like this was elm mm -hmm. um and i think that predated prettier by a little bit but it was yeah. kind of the same sort of thing and yep. i remember looking at elm code um actually i i won't even use my words i'll use richard feldman feldman's here because i think he had a really good um kind of evaluation of this he said um uh, and i'll see if i can find the tweet to back this up but he said something along the lines of i was working with somebody who was new to elm and um they were asking me for feedback on their application that they'd built and um feldman basically tweeted something along the lines of um this person who had just started working with elm not a couple of weeks ago or whatever time period doesn't matter but 
relatively recently. And um, they asked for feedback and I was able to say, um, because Elm format was handling all that, um, it kind of took away any of the kind of idiosyncrasies of like, um, oh, like you should, like it, it made the conversation less about, um, oh, how many spaces are there, yada, yada, yada. Right. Why, infix, postfix, yada, yada, yep. whatever. Um, and more more about the code. The other thing he said is that generally speaking, um, th- uh, he didn't have very much feedback for this person because the Elm framework, in addition to Elm format, kind of caused them to, to think about the application in a certain way yep. that basically made it no different from how um, Feldman would have done it. Exactly. And I think, I think formatters go a long way for that. And I think... Um, there's some other stuff that goes along with that too, but I think formatters are a big part of that for sure. So for any of the Java developers listening to this episode, there is a prettier for Java. It's called prettier Java. Pretty, oh, really? pretty, pretty sure. I'll put a link here in the show notes for everybody to uh, enjoy thoroughly. Um, it's sort of in beta right now. You know, it's, it's pre-release. Um, it probably hasn't had a whole lot of work done on it in a little while, but um, in, in theory you could use this, javascript prettier to prettier java code um and the reason i think that's just so nice is because getting intellij or eclipse or any of these thingamajigs these ides to actually participate in a uniform formatting experience across systems i have never had good luck with it but right. i've always had good luck with prettier and in rust fmt and go fmt so um really just give that a thumb and check that out Hey, you know, um, so the, the, there were these iPhones the other day. Did you hear about those? Oh yeah, I, maybe. I've heard of. I've heard of. I, I've heard of the iPhone. Well, I didn't buy one. I um, bought oh. a different phone oh. instead. That's alright. Um, so we can still be friends. Okay, I'm glad. Um, I think he just muted me. Um, oh. <laughs> no. Um, so I bought a Galaxy Note Nine. Nice. Um, and so uh, this was a phone that was released, I don't know, like early August, mid-August. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were doing some pre-order stuff. I didn't get to pre-order because I don't play. What's that game all the kids play? Do you know? Candy Crush. No, Fortnite. no. That's what all the old people. <laughs> yeah, Fortnite. Yeah, right. Oh, okay. Um, so Fortnite was a thing. Um, apparently, you could get some kind of in-game currency if you did the pre-order. I didn't do that, so uh, I I just bought the phone for the phone. Fair um, enough. So I have had three Galaxy phones now. That's that's a lot of phones from from not Google. Yeah. Um. So that's been pretty weird. Um. So so we'll probably talk more about this on the uh, review that's coming in a few weeks. Um. But it's weird to not have a Google phone. Because I had previously used Nexus phones pretty much the entire time of my phone history, right. um, and and so it turns out the Samsung phones actually in in some ways better than Google phones, some Pixel phones and Nexus phones. Um, but one weird thing is that this phone, the Note Nine, costs a thousand dollars, just like a phone that we all know and love, which was last year's iPhone mm-hmm. Ten. Right, that's what they called it last year. Uh, yeah. The the names of this year are kind of weird, so I just always get confused. So um, I had the S eight plus previously, and then my current phone was the S nine plus, and now I've moved up to the Note nine, which mm-hmm. is yet again even bigger. Um, so I traded in my S eight plus for four hundred fifty dollars, which I thought was a great deal. That sounds magnificent. Um, yeah, totally. So a thousand dollars minus four fifty, but after tax, that came out to just six hundred dollars. So that is a really good phone for a decently okay price. So I am totally happy with this decision to purchase this now. Um, so yeah, the the review will be coming in a few weeks. Um, I can tell you just off the bat that pretty much everything I loved about the s9 and s8 before it is still true about this phone there's a few different few new features that i didn't have before but that now i will have access to um i'll be doing some more tests with the camera um but overall if you liked either of the uh s8 plus or s9 plus phones or any of the other smaller versions of those sure for sure you will like the note in terms of functionality the only difference here is really screen size nice how's that stylus life um, I will tell you significant facts about the Stalus life in a few weeks during the review, but um, 
I will for sure draw you a message later and send it to you in Slack. Nice. Beautiful. <laughs> it's 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 kind of fun. And I, I I'm sure um so do you remember the thing you could do on the um Apple Watch where you could kind of draw a little thing and then send it to somebody? Yeah. 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 That was the Apple Watch, right? Yep. yep. So uh the the phone here, the, the, the Note nine has a stylus and you can take the stylus out and then open a mode where you can draw a message with it. So uh, you can send it as a GIF to the person, the recipient, and they will get it played back to them as if it were being drawn still. So it, you can sketch out hi and then, you know, like whatever your message is. And it's kind of fun because it's a little bit more interactive. I will say that that feature is kind of weird, though, because it takes an absurdly long time to render a GIF. And I wish there were another file format that somebody made that was actually good at sending animated things. It's almost like a a video, you know. Yeah, it'd be like a video, like a WebP or, Mm. um, I don't know. H265 for HEVC. And, and, you know, anything that wasn't a GIF that was like 10 megabytes, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, otherwise, um, really good phone. I got it for a good price. But even if you were getting it for an actual legitimate $1,000, it's still a pretty good phone. Because as you know, all of the phones at this screen size and premium tier all cost about right around this price. This is true. Yeah. So, yeah. So, um, you know, maybe one day I'll get an iPhone, but uh, not this week. Maybe next week. <laughs> maybe next week. Yeah. We'll see. Cool, cool. Well, uh, some other kind of internet-y news happened recently. Um, a little while ago, Twitter deprecated some pretty core APIs used by uh, third-party Twitter clients um, around notifications, um, favorites, um, and some other stuff, too, that makes it really kind of hard to use a third-party client now. Harder. Um, harder, yeah. Um so, for example, recently I was using direct messages with somebody and um, in, in what seemed like relatively real time. And then I realized this person had already sent a bunch of messages that were like reinserted in the timeline further up that I'd never seen or gotten notifications for. I think that kind of um, the all of the streaming API endpoints yep. are now kind of no longer available, mm-hmm. which makes using TweetBot um, really difficult for me. Um, yeah. So I think... That combined with some of Twitter's platform decisions recently around um, their kind of inability to enforce um, their terms of service with regard to uh, certain people who use uh, Twitter and certain certain companies and certain platforms that uh, uh, certain companies rather and certain users that um, kind of are creating content that's really doesn't really deserve to have any platform whatsoever at least. Um, uh, in, in the estimation of many folks, myself included, um, people have been moving over to alternative networks. Uh, and one that we've talked about a little bit and that I think we've all kind of revisited a little bit recently is, is uh, Tentio. Mastodon. Oh, Mastodon. Tentio. <laughs> oh, so close. Um, and Mastodon's really cool. Um, it is a federated social network, so you have a lot of small instances rather than one main website that folks can go to. Um, and those instances are all, generally speaking, running very similar code bases, if not the exact same code base. Yeah, um, I think so. And can talk to one another um, through some agreed upon protocols called ActivityPub and OStatus, I think, are the main two, yep. uh, along with some others. Um, so it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, I think we have an episode about Mastodon that is available on the internet. Um, so if you're more interested in, in uh, kind of the inner workings, that I think we talked through that a little bit there. Um, but um, I don't know. I think one thing to talk about is just like, where are we all on Mastodon? Brian, which which instance are you on? I'm on Mastodon.cloud. Nice. And Ryan, which one are you on? Did we ever figure that out? I, I have no idea. I'm going to go look. I'm on Mastodon Cloud also. Nice. Um, I think that's the original instance, right? The one run um, by Eugen Rothko? No, I think Social is the original instance, right? Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah and true. Social was too busy, so I, I went to the other one. Yeah, yeah I, think I think we all signed up in April, was it? And I signed up later. I, I signed up a year ago, April. Um, and uh, I think I now have f- four, maybe five <laughs> accounts. Um, Jeez. It's kind of... Typical. It's kind of, uh, 
unnecessary, but that's that's how I live my life. The first one I signed up for was uh, Mastodon.xyz because Mastodon.social and Mastodon.cloud were both not accepting invites. And then there was another instance called Cyber.space, C-Y-B-R-E dot space. Uh, and that sounded like fun, so I got an account there too. And then um, around September of last year, I think it was, uh, somebody from the local Twitter community made an instance called MSP Social, and I'm there too. Uh, I just joined that recently, though, because I was mostly just following people on MSP Social um, from one of my other accounts, because I was like, two accounts is already pretty excessive. Um, but then uh, this conference I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, or will have gone to, depending on when this episode is released, probably I will have gone to, hi, time travelers, um, <laughs> is uh, had, had its own instance, has slash had its own instance. So I signed up there. And at that point, I was like, ah, oh, what the heck? I'll just sign up for MSP Social too. So I have four different accounts. All of them, my username is Brandon, um, but they're at different instances and generally speaking, have very different content. Um, so I guess maybe the next thing to talk about is what, what how, how have you guys, what, what, what do you think about Macedon um, with uh, the time that you spent there? What do you think of the difference between Macedon and Twitter, um, both in like using it and like who's there um and do you think it's a real thing that could actually take a sizable chunk out of twitter i think we're working on it i yeah i don't know if this is all the way there yet i the people i follow on mastodon are mostly people who i follow on twitter as well right maybe even exclusively um so there is some overlap there i think the concept of um what is it that's you can hide content what is that? What do they call it? Oh, like a like a content warning? Yeah. Content warning, yeah, CW. I think that's the community is still figuring out when to use that and when that's appropriate. Yeah. You um, know, I, I think I think in terms of can we get normal people to use Mastodon, I don't think the answer is yes yet. Mm-hmm. Because yeah. um you know, it's weird because I when I think of normal people, I think of also people who play games and I I know I know I know a sizable portion of games have the concept of instances and servers and stuff. But then simultaneously, I know those same people aren't normal people because they play WoW. Right. So, I don't know. It's it's hard. Um, I mean, you know, it, 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 I think when, when we get to the point where somebody makes an interface that is a little bit more appealing somehow, and I don't know what that means yet, um, the default ma- Mastodon interface is kind of this column kind of tweet deck like style interface yeah um you know when somebody makes the uh, facebook equivalent interface which is funny because it's really just blue and right. a single co- single column um you know maybe that's when um it gets big enough to actually get some people to actually try it yeah. that are from the normal sphere um of users mm-hmm. and and you know maybe that's um maybe that's a single instance that somebody makes and it has a, a special skin for it. And then maybe that special instance also has enough money to make, um, a few really nice apps, but for themselves. Right. Um, so basically it's a first party Mastodon client instance thing, I guess. Right. Um, I don't know. I think, I think we're just a little bit, um, away from when that happens. Um, but I can totally imagine that happening. I think there are problems too, with linking to, user accounts on other instances um, and kind of where to draw the line there. Um, I think, too, if instances start implementing special features, it's going to break compatibility or really start to have a more centralized feel if there's clearly one instance that puts way more effort into it. Um, so I think, you know, the balancing open source community contributing back to the rest of the other instances um which third party or first party applications become very popular, how well they keep up with the features and support things like linking to other accounts and things like that. I think there's a lot still to be played out. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I like the service a lot though. Um, I, so what, what I've been waiting for for years and so diaspora was sort of like it, but for the Facebook model and this is, this is obviously Twitter, but, you know this is this is mastodon for the twitter model like that's cool what all of those things had in common and what i've always wanted is basically wordpress but for social networking um because you can go to wordpress.com and you can sign up for a wordpress account and they'll host your thing for free 
if you need some extra features you can pay for it cool um but then if you actually want to go off on your own and have your own plugins and your own little customizations your own theme you can go spin up your own wordpress blog and it uses roughly the same code base except somebody else hosts it it's you um and i think mastodon is getting pretty close to that we're we're still not there yet but we're getting closer for sure um, one other thing i'll mention about mastodon for the technical audience is that it for some reason has decided to use um not what i would have thought it it uses ruby on rails to 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 work oh yeah yep it's definitely a rails app and uh, and i and every time i see that and and i and i check back frequently i always wonder are you sure you want to do that um because you know it's it's ruby on rails well while it's perfectly fine for some crud apps and you know that kind of thing it might not be the most horizontally or vertically scalable solution out there no i feel that i think um you know i think twitter made that discovery too at yep. some point twitter was very heavily rails driven and then uh that kind of uh changed changed pretty quickly yeah. um i think you know some of the things that help with that is most instances are pretty small other than mastodon.social yeah and cloud um, and a few others yeah right 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 um and i think you know i i like it because i've kind of helped to hack on some stuff for msp.social or mspsocial.net sometimes um but like i i agree with you that like if there were ever to be one centralized instance which i don't think um the creators of mastodon are hoping for if you look through the github issues they have a lot of conversation there about how they don't want um to introduce features like local only posts that cause oh the totally community to be even more insular oh i agree but i um but i agree with you that like technically it's interesting to see how much of the activity pub stuff and o, o status stuff is also in ruby mm-hmm. um and I think you and I were talking in Slack a little bit, Ryan, about how there seem to be other O status implementations and yep. some other activity pub servers out there that looked intriguing, but most of them were just GitHub repository stuff. Yeah. Like I felt kind of embarrassed when I sent you that link to that Rust one mm-hmm. and the Rust O O status implementation was like non existent. It was yeah. like a bootstrapped thing. Po- zero um, point zero point one. Right, 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 right. And it was yeah. like clear somebody had somebody wrote the readme as though it was done um, not done and i know and i know nothing next to rust um but it wasn't I done next, i know next to nothing about rust but it was very clearly not done yeah uh, and that was pretty clear as soon as i started looking at the code um, yeah so when i when i poke around the uh the mastodon repo you know it's in rails and that's fine but uh but i'm still dreaming for the day it's not in rails and it's in either rust or go yeah. only because the um this the performance levels at um of what you can get for the same code um uh-huh. is is orders of magnitude different so what you can get in rails is 1x what you can get in go is 2 to 3x and what you can get in rust might be 5x and while the code might be more complicated um in some parts it might actually get simpler and maybe even more um secure and safe in some ways um so yeah, maybe that that's just and 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 maybe uh, in the future Mastodon as a system protocol, um, you know, having adopted Oat Status and ActivityPub as sort of its underlying protocols, maybe that'll be robust enough to actually have multiple implementations right. somewhere. Uh, yeah, and there already is like uh, GNU Social is another implement thing that implements both ActivityPub and Oat Status. Yeah, but I haven't looked into that whatsoever. I'm sure you have to look at. What, what's the one called uh there's like some desert themed like gnu github or gnu social or uh, yeah I'm, i don't know what that one's called but is it yeah. called like bizarre or savannah gnu savannah i think that's what it's called it's uh, yeah like i've their, heard of something their like github that. their github is like yep. is like that um i and i just i can't be bothered to uh to deal with the free software foundation yeah and, and you shouldn't because when you go to their website it, it looks like it came from the 90s so watch out right yep oh man yep that's that, that, retro. That, that that's probably not it but i don't know it looks know. like a looks... like a track kind of theme yeah. yeah so that's that's the that's their like git server which is entertaining because I think that's where you have to go to get to the GNU social thing, but I don't Perf- know where that is. I don't know either. Find it. Perfect. Just how could I? 
Um, but yeah, so so one day I think the the servers, the internals will get better. Um, not that they're bad, but you know. Um, so yeah, I think that's cool. Um, the other day I was helping somebody who who I follow on Twitter um, kind of get used to the the whole Mastodon concept, and it it is confusing because there's a federated timeline, there's the local timeline. Um, and, and, and of course there's tons of different instances. And of course I want to make my own instance because I'm just a weirdo like that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Well, we're going to have to see where this goes and I think we'll, it'll be evolving over the time. You know, this has been done before, of course. And I made the joke earlier about tent, tent IO. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't, I think that was a, an entirely original, um, protocol concept. It was not activity pub because that didn't exist five years ago. Right. Um, Brian remembers Tentio very well, I know. <laughs> yep, very, very, very well. So, so well, he can't even speak about it. Yeah, that's how it works. Yep, it's, uh, it was good. So, yeah, I think, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll be sticking around Mastodon for a little while, at least. Yeah. Yep. So, you know what time it is. What time is it? Well, it's time for new Twitter followees and new Mastodon followees. <laughs> Entertainingly, this time, I don't have any. Um, I don't you know have none? Is. I have none. So, so you, you went from 2,000 to 4,000 to 4,000. 4,000, yeah. Uh, plus or minus zero, I think is the phrase. Plus or minus um, zero, yeah. Uh-huh. So, uh... No, no delta. So what's happened in your life that caused you to suddenly stop following new people? Um, Are you feeling stuff. okay? <laughs> I, uh, no I think he needs to lay down. He's yeah, ill. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh... Yeah. Uh, anyhow, Brian, who did you follow? Um, so a couple people on this list are those that I think you guys have followed forever ago that I finally did. So the first being Dan Abramov, which is at Dan underscore Abramov. Kind of spelled how it sounds. He's a... He works on React. He co-authored Redux and Create React App. He's got lots of opinions and lots of React experience and he posts a lot and it's cool to, to read about. He is very, very cool. He's pretty nice. He's fun. Yeah, I would consider him a very good kid. The next person is Kent C. Dots, and he's another cool JavaScripter. He might be on TC39. Also, I guess he works for PayPal, and he's done stuff for Egghead and Frontend Masters. And I think I've seen him talk, but I don't really remember exactly when or where or what he talked about, but JavaScript Minnesota. I, yeah, I know for a fact he was at JSMN, and I know he was talking about his uh, component styling library that I believe was called... Uh, gl not glimmer. Glimmer's the ember thing. Um, glamorous. It was yeah, like that sounds it was right. Like glamour um, became like glamour kind of fell out of favor, and then he created glamorous, and now it's a PayPal thing. And yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay, I remember that talk. Yeah. Yep. But um, it looks like we did not record that, or if we did, um, somebody at some point requested us not to post it. So post it. We did not. Um, Too bad. But I, I trust that somebody remembers that that talk did happen. Yeah, so uh, I have four people this episode. So number three is uh, Amro Musa. He's uh, one of the iOS developers at Twitter. Um, I saw some tweets retweeted of his when the, all the discussion about the Twitter streaming APIs being taken down. Being taken down. Um, so I gave him a follow there. So he's Tweets a bit about Twitter itself and other things, too. So, yeah. Nice. And finally, uh, Shalana Dawson, who just gave a, uh, a talk at the end of August at JavaScript Minnesota on, like, a, what was it, type, typography or the different yeah. ways of rendering typefaces and fonts between print form, like, literally physical print media and um, the web. And that was super interesting. Yeah, it was a really awesome talk, and it was cool to see just how much of, uh, how much of that is stuff that like people don't really think about when they're building for the web, right? Yeah. Um, but is it's so 
it's so like critical when you actually see it live for sure and i even used a after she was describing how line height works i even used that at work the next day to fix a bug i was trying to fix figure nice. out. nice perfect nice it was great spinner font font based spinners change when they when you render them into the dom would like increase the line height but just line height zero and it was fine nice so right on the more you know yep. all right that's it for me well i don't have any twitter followers but i do have some um, mastodon thingamajigs what do you what do you call twi- followers on mastodon because uh, tweets are tweets or toots okay so it's new 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 yeah. mastodon pals okay so 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 a pal is somebody who follows you and a friend is somebody who you follow i don't know that I'm hurts that i can't how think about, how about tutors no no that's all right <laughs> no i'm not I, gonna do that one yeah i think that's a noble family or something so that's i don't know that's an e for effort <laughs> uh, Love um it. so so i I, did, I just put my um mastodon cloud handle here in the notes just so that everybody can go and see what i do um but I follow this new guy called Ian R. Buck and this other guy called Brian Mitchell. And I, for some reason, I apparently don't follow Brandon. So that's okay. I don't know why. I um, don't say anything <laughs> entertaining, so it's all good. But um, so the other day, um, Rands, um, whose name is Michael Lopp in real life, um, whose blog I read and who I follow on Twitter, was trying Mastodon. So I followed him on Mastodon and kind of walked him through some of the stranger aspects of being on Mastodon. So that was cool. So I, I follow Rands on Mastodon now. A cool individual, to be sure. For sure. And he has a, a book that you should read about managing people or something. So you got you got to plug the products of other people that you follow on Twitter. That's what you got to do. That's true. That's how it works. That's how it works. Um, so maybe one day I'll actually follow actual people on Mastodon, but it's not today. Today is not that day, indeed. No. That's it for me. Awesome. Well, this has been really cool. Thanks, yeah. you guys. So, normally we would talk about next time, but that's far too far in the future to even speculate about. But there will be a next time. We just don't know when. But yeah, but uh, few similar weeks. things happening on the network these days. Um, take a listen to the uh, Apple September event Nexus special. Um, Brandon and I will likely be reviewing new um, our new iPhones soon. Um, iOS 12 review. Yeah, yeah. The Apple things. And I would like to have a, a discussion about Macs at some point because I know what, Brandon um, and I are, might be buying What's that new Mac new operating system called? Do we, Mojave. 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 Oh, yeah, we should probably do a review on that too. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably have to do a light review on that. I mean, it's it's an operating system on a computer. I mean, they can't change that much, right? I don't know. Yeah. This, uh, this one has dark mode, and that's pretty fun. It also causes my MacBook to kernel panic, which is also fun. That is also very fun. I'm That'll feed very well into a We so Need New Max episode. Are you sure dark mode isn't this the, the terminal when it comes up after it crashes? Oh, there's that too. Uh, okay. T- That's a different kind of dark mode. <laughs> take, take your pick, really. Yeah, the, the darkest timeline of modes. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, so so there's a ton of ton of good stuff coming out here in the future. Um, Podkit will return after some of that. Um, so where can we find you on the internet? Uh, we can find me just about anywhere, but particularly on mastodon.xyz, where my username is Brandon nice and easy to remember because it's just my name no underscores none of that unlike the bird site you can also find me roaming the streets of minneapolis probably drinking coffee and maybe sparring with my macbook that occasionally kernel panics uh you can find me on twitter at brian mitch l or on mastodon.cloud slash brian mitch l um also you can find me downtown minneapolis towards the end of this month and early october going to various concerts in the span of a couple of weeks nice so good nice and of course you can find me just about everywhere but especially on the twitter at Ranmar, and of course on mastodon at Ranmar. i have no idea which instance and also of course on my website ranmarpercent.com where i have all sorts of stuff that link to other places awesome and of course this episode is uh episode 42 of podkit and you can find the show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk42 which is of course the answer to everything and of course you can find um, some discussion on our subreddit r slash thenexus tv and uh, you can also go on to the patreon 
where you can, uh, you know, support us and, you know, encourage us to do things like this episode, you know, those kinds of things at patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. So good. I'm really glad that we got a Hitchhiker's Guide reference in there. I was, yeah, uh, I, 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 I feel could... like... I couldn't let it go. I feel like I've abdicated my duty to include it uh, earlier on, but I appreciate that, that you got it in there. I, I had to get it in there. As we all must. Yep. Truly, truly. Well, great. This was fun. We'll do it again. Yeah, have a good one. Have a good one. Don't forget your towel. Watch out for cars. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV. Podcasts from, from the, the Technological, technological Convergence. convergence.